Welcome to Embracing the Difference Globally, the Ability event. Session three will begin shortly. I'd like to just take a moment to thank our partners this year. Rehabilitation Counseling Program from St. Cloud State University, St. Cloud State University Special Education Department, Hamlin University, Metropolitan State University, and Normandale Community College. Good afternoon and welcome to this third session of the Ability Event Series. This year, we're celebrating the 15th anniversary of the adoption of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD, uh, the only international treaty addressing the human rights for persons with disabilities. Uh, the Ability Event is hosted by the Rehabilitation Studies Programs at St. Cloud State University in collaboration with Hamlin University, Metro State University and Normandale Community College. I'm Michelle Bonfilio, a graduate student in the Rehabilitation and Addiction Counseling Grant Scholar Program. I'm a white woman with short, dark hair. Uh, my sweater is dark and I'm seated in front of a background decorated with Chinese written characters. I'd like to take a moment to introduce, uh, allow our ASL interpreters to introduce themselves. Um, Amy Kalmus and Don Raymond. <laughs> Thank you. Before we begin, if you allow me to just read a few housekeeping items. If you need CRC CEUs, uh, after you pay for the session fee and attend the webinar, you'll be eligible for those. And after the ability series is complete, you'll be issued a CEU a certificate. All ability sessions are recorded and they're available for free on our YouTube page. So you'll still be able to gain those CEU credits by watching the recordings and taking a CEU quiz. New this year, you can earn a micro badge. So if you're interested in using the sessions to earn one, uh, please email Amy Knopf at a h k n o p f at St. Cloud State edu. And now it's my pleasure today to introduce you to our guest. Uh, Isabel Hodge is a distinguished leader and advocate in the disability rights movement. She's executive director of the United States Council, uh, International Council on Disabilities, where she manages a global network of disability, um, excuse me, a global network and consulting hub uh, with relationships with organizations of persons with disabilities around the world. Uh, Isabel is guided by her commitment to the full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by people with disabilities. Isabel is a Marine Corps veteran who received the Commander in Chief's Special Recognition for Installation of Excellence Award from President Bill Clinton. She currently serves as Vice President of Disabled Peoples International North America and the Caribbean, and also serves on the Board of Directors for Wheelchairs for Kids International. He's also advisor to the Enabled Children's Initiative, which works to improve the quality of life for Afghans with disabilities. Isabel's middle child, Alistair, is an adult who has autism and an intellectual disability. She herself is a person uh, with a disability, and Isabel is the spouse of a disabled Marine Corps veteran. Um, Isabel, welcome. Uh, will you please introduce yourself with your audio description, and then please, I introduce sure. us to the International Council on Disability. Thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, well, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about USIT and the CRPD. Um, everyone, um, I am the Executive Director for the US International Council on Disabilities. Um, we refer to it as USIT. So um, I'll make this conversation a lot easier if I just use the acronym. Um, I am a, a white woman. I use the pronouns she, her, hers, and my hair is long, brown, and with a little gray, and it's pulled up right now. And um, I'm wearing a blue and white shirt and blue pants. And I'll have to share with everybody, I'm actually from Glasgow, Scotland. So I have a slight Scottish broke, but um, uh, hopefully the car in ASL can understand me. Are we good? <laughs> okay. Delightful, thank you. So about, you said we're about a 30 year old 501c3 nonprofit that's based in Stafford, Virginia now, which is just about an hour south of Washington, DC and very close to Marine Corps Base Quantico. Um, today they're not doing the live bombing, um, but sometimes I've been on calls where, where 
people have heard the bombing in the distance because we have a live firing range. So um, USA's mission is to advance international disability rights and inclusive develop development and to build bridges among US and foreign governments, disability and human rights communities, and the private sector through strategic advocacy, convening and training and education. Um, we have a very interesting history. A lot of people don't know this, but we had, there was two predecessors to use it. Both were named the US Council on International Rehabilitation or USER. Um, the first USER came to life during the efforts of community pillars of an earlier time who recognized in the post-World War II era that people were dis with disabilities needed help and thus their work was inspired by the then focus on medical rehabilitation. Uh, these supporters who formed the first user had high, very high level political connections in DC and in New York and were able to influence the financing of government programs that were implemented at the state level. So the first user ran out of steam um, as his members basically aged out and a new wave of government policies in the 70s and 80s replaced the earlier designs um, we envisioned. And then the second user incorporated the government programs and its membership and was really instrumental in attracting other non-governmental organizations with an international um, interest to its membership. And this group in the late 80s understood that the voice of people with disabilities was essential to the successful design and implementation of programs. And USER changed its name to USER in 1992. So a lot of people didn't know that. And um, so there you have it. You have a brief history of USER. Um, our past board presidents have been John Lancaster, um, the very famous um, and much loved Marco Bristow. And our current president is one of your upcoming speakers, um, Dr. Patricia Morrissey. Um, over the, the years, there have been several executive directors. In 2009, USAID hired a full time executive director, David Morrissey, and I was hired as the deputy in 2015 and then went on to be hired as the executive director in 2017. So I have a team of volunteers and intermittent interns with disabilities and international fellows, but I am the only full-time employee. So um, just some highlights about a little bit about our work. Um, you know that in 2012 and in 2014, you had led the campaign to ratify the CRPD. And since J.D. Um, Human left the State Department, we've been advocating heavily for a permanent office on international disability rights, um, led by an ambassador at large, um, also advocating for deinstitutionalization for a new or revised disability policy at USAID. And we're in the middle of piloting our CRPD Article 32 training um, that was funded by Rehabilitation International. And um, many of you know that we're working with Afghan advocates and forming, former um, government personnel or officials from the Afghan government. Uh, We've been working with them for the last few weeks around the clock to help them evacuate out of Kabul. So those are just a few highlights of, of my work and our work. Thank, thank you for kind of leading into those different areas because I think many of us are interested. They're very germane to all the discussions we, we are eager to have with you today. Um, you, you mentioned in the history of um, that started out post-World War II. We've got government folks involved. Uh, you've got early on saying, we want folks involved who have disabilities helping us shape policy. You've got volunteers involved. Um, so much of your background, a former, former Marine, person with a disability. What, 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 how did all of your life experience, your career experience drive you toward 
wanting to be involved or were you dragged kicking and screaming? Tell us a little bit about your experience that made you want to be involved. Um, I, I wasn't in any way um, dragged kicking and screaming. <laughs> That's good. I like that. Um, I was serving in the Marine Corps and stationed in Okinawa, Japan in 1990 when the, the ADA was signed by President Bush. So I really had no connection to disability at that time. It really was when my son was born in 1991 and diagnosed with the autism and told that he should be institutionalized that I became an, an advocate for myself and for other military families. It, the military lifestyle is very difficult in that um, it's very unlikely that you're ever going to get stationed in an area where you have family. So your family beca becomes other military families. Um, and especially those that are going through, you know, similar issues or, you know, have that, that lifestyle where you're, you're juggling deployments, but also um, working on advocacy for your family member with a disability or chronic condition. So any, anyway, long story short, years later, I find myself writing policy at the Department of Defense in the office of the Secretary of defense and military community and family policy um, for the exceptional family member program. And um, what was really interesting was, was that Dr. Rudd Turnbull, I think everybody probably is aware of, of Rudd Turnbull and from the Beach Center in Kansas, who's now retired, but um, has done a lot on special education. It was from a recommendation from him and at the request of the commissioner of the Administration on Developmental Disabilities that I, I was asked to do a federal detail for a year and it turned into a year and a half. And I think it was then that I realized, um, you know, I had a much bigger mission in life. Um, I was doing great things for military families with disabilities through the EFMP program, but I could do much more um, for, for you know, the American community. Um, I think the only problem I didn't solve when I was at DOD was the portability of me Medicaid. Um, one time I was at a conference and, and I brought up, you know, let's give military families priority on, on the Medicaid waiting list. And I thought somebody was going to take their shoe and off and throw it at me. Um, so I'll never bring that up again at a, a disability conference. But um, that experience, you know, reading the clearances and, and commenting and clearances at both the Department of Defense and, and you know, HHS, and the administration of developmental disabilities really um, helped me understand a lot of the issues. I also am um, drafted, you know, worked on the draft for the DD Act regulations. And again, that was a wonderful experience, but um, there was two things that happened when I was at DOD and, and at ADD. Uh, I was actually able to do the clearance for the CRPD in both agencies. And that doesn't happen to be able to comment on the CRPD at both DOD and then at HHS. So I was able to think about, you know, how would this, by the US ratifying, how would that impact military families um, with medical or special education or chronic medical needs? Um, our disabilities, how would that impact their life if we see, if we ratified? And then on the HHS side, how, you know, with all of the, the legislation that, that, that we have, how will it, how will ratifying impact, um, you know, regular Americans with disabilities? So it was interesting to do that analysis and provide those comments. And I think, um, they were very well received. So I, I returned to the Department of Defense um, after my detail, and it was around that time that Pat Morrissey and I started to talk about the CRPD and how to gra grow a real grassroots movement and make it stronger and, 
you know, we started to speak about usage and I was ready at that time to really step out of the, of the federal government and, um, you know, use what I'd learned at the DOD, at HHS, and through my own life experience as an advocate um, to do more. And Pat mentioned that USID was looking for a deputy director and, you know, I felt like it's a perfect opportunity. So you're you were in the in the Marines still. You were working for Department of Defense, and then also in Health and Human Services. Um, no, it, I had, not, I had left the Marine Corps. You had left the Marines. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for that clarification. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then when you moved to USID, how how and you brought that with you. What role did USID then play in the drafting and the adoption of the Convention on the Rights of the CRPD? Um. So the. You know that the CRPD was created out of the United States leadership in adopting the Americans with Disabilities Act and our vision of empowering individuals with disabilities to achieve economic self-sufficiency, independent living, inclusion and integration into society, all aspects of society. And the ADA along with the ID. IDA at the Rehab Act and other disability legislation, you know, really meant that U.S. laws provide the basic protection in the CRPD. Um, so ratifying would not only reaffirm or unequivocally, you know, have an unequivocal commitment to the promotion of disability rights abroad, but would invigorate the implementation of our own um, robust laws domestically. So you said um, had a lot of expertise in house. We had several board members and staff involved in the drafting of the CRPD. You know, Pat Morrissey, John Wodash at the time um, had just retired from the Office of Civil Rights Department of Justice. Um, Judy Human, everybody knows Judy, um, just to name a few and, and they continue to have a role, um, you know, not in the drafting of the CRPD, but all of the um, peripheral things that happen. So, for example, our board member, jo Janet Lord, is serving as a senior cons legal consultant to the special rapporteur, Gerard Quinn. Um, so, so the, the active role then um, that you have played in moving CRPD forward, your role, uh, USID's role, working directly with so many um, disability organizations for people with disabilities, you work in a consultative role. What are some of the challenges um, that disability rights organizations themselves right now are having in understanding or implementing CRPD? And how is USID assisting them with that? <laughs> um, I really don't think that disability rights organizations really have challenges understanding the CRPD. Um, rather, I think it's uh, they're really super busy with advocating on domestic issues, especially during the COVID um, pandemic. So what we need is for organize organizations and individuals who are knowledgeable about the CRPD to really educate those who ask that question, why should the, the US ratify them when we already have that vast array of US laws and you know, also counter the opposition's allegation that it takes away state sovereignty, takes away parental rights and supports, supports abortion, none of these of which are true. Um, and I really hope that previous speakers talked about RUTs, the reservations, understandings, and declarations um, when they talked about the CRPD, because that's important when we talk about, you know, any opposition to ratifying. Um, so most provisions of the tre treaty are consistent with U.S. legislation, but uh, it's anything in the disability world, we know there's always room for improvement, right? Um, so, for example, supported decision making, we may not have ratified the CRPD, but there's actually a movement now in the US towards, um, you know, 
supported decision making and it really has its art roots in article 12 of the CRPD. So I'm always available to speak with groups about the, the convention. And we have a new learning management system that just rolled out this week on USA's website. It's um, where we're piloting that Article 32 international cooperation training. Um, and it, it really dives deep into you know, not just Article 32, but how it impacts other sectors and how to monitor and report on Article 32. So um, that's going to be a great resource for anyone that learns wants to learn more about the CRPD. Thank you. That's really helpful to have that clarification. Uh, we, we hear a lot about uh, here at home, our frustration uh, with having to wait uh, for, for, to talk about ratification. Um, when we think about United States policy abroad, what actions uh, does USAID want to see the United States take? So we're oh. able to show, show at least that we uh, have a comprehensive approach to inclusive foreign policy. So obviously we want to ratify the CR, CRPD, but we also want to um, establish a, a permanent codified office on international disability rights at the Department of State and led by an ambassador at large. Um, again, 15% of the world's population has a disability and we have absolutely no leadership at the Department of State. Um, this is really where USA needs your help. We also want to make sure that all of the projects and, and programs that are funded by US taxpayers um, overseas are, are all of our overseas projects and pro programs that are funded by U.S. taxpayers, sorry, are disability inclusive and don't in any way segregate people with disabilities, that's children and adults. Um, in August, um, myself and, and several of our, our board members took part in the USAID consultation on their upcoming policy revision. And, you know, we're really looking forward to seeing how they will mandate inclusion across all of the agency's sectors. Um, we conducted a, a study a few years ago and we found that although the policy is mentioned in USAID solicitations, um, we reviewed 80, 85 solicitations and 48% of those did not mention disability within their scope of work, even though they have a policy. And only 20% reviewed um, that we reviewed required people with disabilities to be included and to participate in any meaningful way and throughout the program. So that's, that's quite dismal. Um, so to be honest, other disability leaders outside the US are wondering what the heck is going on. Um, we used to be front and center when Judy was the special advisor at state and now we're hearing, they are hearing crickets and see very few disability grants coming out of USAID. And we're, we're hearing, you know, this is very concerning that we're hearing from countries that ratified or going to other countries that have ratified like the Chinese for support with their implementation of the CRPD um, for help with capacity building and for things like, um, you know, purchasing fleets of accessible buses and assistive technology. So this isn't good. And, you know, the U.S. has you know, if, over 50 years of experience in this area and they should be coming to us for help. We're losing a lot of opportunities. So that's an impactful statement, I think, for the for the students, especially. There was a lot of discussion when we hear that in the ability events. Um, that's that's our question: is what do we do moving forward to be helpful and supportive in that area? I, I think then a follow up question is that in your consultative role for USAID. Uh, when you serve uh, the U.S. the National Assembly um, in Disabled Peoples International, um, why is that impactful both here at home and internationally? And is that connected to perhaps moving the United States forward? It, it's a good question. Um, 
Yusid is a National Assembly member in DPI, and that gives us a much stronger voice at the UN than if we just went to the UN by ourselves. So collectively, you know, gives us a stronger voice. Um, most of my DPI work right now is focused on the Caribbean region as the vice president of um, DPI North America and the Caribbean. And I've really been trying to, hard to get attention in that region. Um, much of the development funding is going to Haiti. Um, but what I've found is that a lot of other countries in that region need a lot of help with implementing the CRPD. Um, you know, we see terrible images coming out of the global south, but what most people aren't aware of um, is that the, the conditions are very much the same for people in the Caribbean. You know, I met a gentleman who was basically living in a shed um, and was lying in his bed for 15 years, relying on the help of other advocates with disabilities. I met a little girl in Antigua that couldn't go to school because she didn't have a wheelchair. Um, you know, in a, in Antigua is a middle income country. It's not um, described as less resourced in any way. So um, they do have a lot of advocacy that needs to be done there, a lot of improvement on you know, their existing national laws. Um, and uh, so, so I would, in addition to, to our involvement with DPI, I'd also like to mention that we're an associate member of Rehabilitation International. We have consultative status with the UN Economic and Social Council, and we regularly host, co-host site events at the, the conference of state parties at the United Nations um, was spoken at the International Labor Organization in Geneva, and we've participated in the high-level political forum. So I know a lot of people will say, well, you know, USAID has been a part of DPI for a long time. Yes, but we're also a part of a lot of different um, organizations too. You know, we've got memberships in other places and, and are involved in other ways. And so that, that's part of, part of the heart of your organization's mission then, is to, is to specifically um, be involved in many of those types of organizations, to have a finger kind of in the pulse of what's going on in many different organizations. Can you kind of share a little bit more about that, the end of your last comment? Yeah, um, so you said one of, in our strategic plan for um, the ends in 2013, one of the areas was representation. And I believe it was in past um, strategic plans before I came to USAID, um, that, but really that we should be representing um, U.S. disability, um, persons with disabilities across the U.S. at, at all of these different venues and, and, you know, making sure they're, they have a voice at the table, even though we haven't ratified. Um, there's still ways we can represent. Um, I've spoken several times at the, the, the U.N. Conference of State Parties. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying on that. Um, this is a shift back to earlier in your first conversation when you were sort of laying out some of the areas that you're involved in. Um, and of course, being a former Marine, as well as um, a disability rights activist, um, back in 2017, um, you said held a disabilities rights conference uh, in partnership with the U.S. Afghan Women's Council. Um, and at that, the um, Afghan Deputy Minister of Labor and Social Affairs, um, Martyrs and the Disabled, who was a woman with a disability. Um, she said, for the first time in history, the government uh, has made protections and promotions of rights of persons with disabilities a national priority. Uh, she said that in 2017. And of course, if we fast forward to the present, with great empathy, um, I'm wondering what, what role do you envision you said having a use of the CRPD, uh, NGOs, what role um, playing in supporting the needs of people with disabilities? 
in Afghanistan? I'm really glad you asked that question and I'm going to try not to get emotional about this because um, I have a very strong connection with the the Afghans with disabilities that attended our conference. Um, but le let me share a few things. So the, the US State Department disability team reached out to me on August 15th um, because they knew I had that strong connection with the government officials and activists. And they asked me if I knew of anybody that wanted to evacuate. So I you know, reached out to everybody I knew and they started sending me their passports, their national IDs and other, you know, information. And all of that went into this um, database that's given to this task force who makes the decisions on who gets a P2 visa or a special immigrant visa. Um, we were concerned that, you know, not one of the individuals that we recommended um, or sponsored as an organization um, was evacuated before August 31st. Um, we wrote to President Biden, we wrote to the House and Senate Foreign Relations Committee and Secretary Blinken about our concerns. We know now that three individuals um, did get out and they made it to the UK and Denmark, but that wasn't through the efforts of the United States. So yesterday I met with the State Department um, Disability uh, Lead and Cody, and tomorrow I'm meeting with the White House Disability Policy, Domestic Disability Policy Advisor on this issue. So, um, so what can you do, do to help? Um, I think it's you know important that we we as a community say to the the administration and to the House and Senate that we can't leave our brothers and sisters with disabilities um, in Afghanistan behind. Um, we've already heard about executions of peace, people with disabilities, about the abduction of the son of an advocate that attended the, the conference in DC. Um, we heard about the Taliban um, throwing a grenade into the home of one of the NGO leaders. Um, and we also heard about from one of the, the conference attendees that he was given approval by the Canadian government to go to the airport. He had all his paperwork, but he wandered around all of the crowds in the filth, um, couldn't find the right gate, couldn't find the right persons to talk to. And he was, he's an amputee. So he was in a lot of pain. He walked around for four hours. So, um, you know, that's just another story. Um, they all, you know, need to be prioritized after U.S. citizens and U.S. green card holders. Um, we know that the Taliban has used people with disabilities, especially those with intellectual and developmental disabilities, as suicide bombers um, in the past. So they have no regard for Article 11 and the protection and safety of persons with disabilities and armed conflict. Yeah. Um, thank you for um, answering that question, which is difficult to answer and difficult to hear for us. I'm going to shift forward to a question that I had saved for later. And that is that we often ask as students, what can we do to help? And we hear, um, you, you know, connect with your, uh, legislators, and I, and I know that you've seen these questions in advance, and one of the things that I had asked was, what does that mean, and how can we learn to do that if we're not people who understand, you know, how do you write, you know, how do you write a letter, how do you make the calls, can, can you help us understand what does that mean, and how can we learn that at grassroots, is, is so, there a challenge? what do we do, help us, because I think I'm probably not the only person who's going yeah, to yeah. do that. what does that mean? You know, when I was um, at the DOD, I, I'd never, you know, gone to the extent to where I wrote to a member of Congress. I didn't know any of that. And so, you know, it's been a real education over the years um, to learn, you know, how do national organizations really reach down and, and educate grassroots folks about, you know, reaching out to their House or, or Senate um, members of Congress. And so, 
I thought about that when I was building the new use of website, you know, what kind of information is going to be helpful. So in our initiative section, you'll, if you drop down to advocacy, you'll see another drop down where it takes you to our call to action specifically on the, the office on international disability rights. And there's some information on how to contact your, your members of Congress about this, this particular issue. Um, I think it's important that you know who your representatives are and communicate with them regularly about any concerns that you have. And um, they need to hear from constitu their constituents. And if they hear enough times from their constituents, they're not going to ignore us. Um, so I, I think, you know, everybody has an important role. Um, I would ask that that you know, you think about becoming a, a member of the U.S. International Council on Disabilities. It's fifty dollars for an individual, and it's four hundred dollars for organizations. Very reasonable um, membership uh, fees. And you know, when we're thinking about the future in the CRPD, we're really looking hard at twenty twenty two and those midterm elections. And so we really want to make sure that we have a strong network at USAID so that we can start working towards, okay, who in the Senate is going to reintroduce the CRPD? Is the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in a favorable position towards the CRPD? And if they're not, how can we change that? So growing our, our you know, USAID membership and our allies is very important. Thank you. And, and as you're talking about that, I'm thinking about in terms of grassroots, um, the more folks, especially of, of all generations, who get behind anything um, like that is going to make for much stronger uh, support. As you're talking about Afghanistan, um, especially even thinking about with your experience as a veteran, it brings to mind um, something that I did read um, about um, USAID and CRPD, and that's that um, it's actually a group of 22 uh, veteran military organizations, and that includes student veterans of America, um, representing veterans with disabilities of all eras, uh, support CR CPRD, excuse me. Um, and I'm wondering, um, as a, a former Marine, and you're deeply familiar with the um, Exceptional Family Member Program, help us understand why, C, um, why um, CPRD is so important U.S. veterans and military and their families who have disabilities, especially abroad. Yeah, so let me just uh, explain first, what is the Exceptional Family Member Program? So I, I, um, I would imagine for a minute that you're uh, an employee of IBM, for example, and um, you've been told that you're going to have to go to another uh, work at another location. They're going to they're going to help move your family to from Washington D.C. to Seattle. That company is not going to give any consideration to the fact that you have a family member with a disability or a chronic medical condition or special education needs. They're not going to even ask you in the Department of Defense. It costs a lot of money to ship, you know, all of the household goods, um, you know, to make sure we have a service member that is in the right occupational specialty in the right place with the supports he needs. So um, it's a identification program. It identifies those service members that have those conditions. And then um, it also, you know, does the assignment coordination piece. So there's this, this form that I actually developed at DOD called the 2792, the DD form. And it basically um, you know, gives the providers, um, whether they're medical or special education you know, providers, they, they can complete the form to let the DOD know, here's everything this family, this individual needs. Um, these are the type of specialty providers they need, because what we we don't want to happen is for a family to go to an area, like let's say they had a cardiac issue, um, and they need to see a provider three times a year, or they're, um, you know, they're in remission from 
can't from having cancer and they need to see an oncologist, you know, several times a year. We don't want to put them in a position where we send them to a base overseas and um, those providers don't exist or they just left or the the providers that are out in the community do not meet the quality, you know, the quality standards that the U.S. has. So, um, you know, Many years ago, the Department of Defense saw that you know this was a high lo- a high cost to to send people back to the U.S. because we've we've not done our due diligence to make sure that 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 location was appropriate for that family. Um, it was a big cost, so they decided you know we need a program that identifies them and really coordinates that assignment. So. Um, there's about 125,000 people enrolled in the program. That surprises a lot of people, but there actually should be a lot more than that enrolled. We have a lot of service members that uh, won't enroll because they think it might impact their career in some way. Um, so going to the question of why um, it's important to our, our veterans, our military families, as those countries are ratifying the CRPD and implementing their national laws, things are going to get better, like the quality of the healthcare um, providers and how they include people with disabilities, um, ramps, you know, throughout the country, um, elevators and buildings, all of that you'll start to see. And it means that, you know, when we're looking at basis to send military families to. We're also looking at the hardships they might experience just living in the community because, you know, um, when I say base, I also include things like embassies and consulates and things like, and forward facing bases. So, um, you know, we look at all of that. Um, and if that, that person uses a wheelchair and we know that, that they're going to have multiple obstacles in just you know living their daily life in that location then we're going to reconsider that assignment um so for veterans you know a lot of veterans are are then go on to become civilian employees and they want to or they just want to live overseas um and so you know again as the crpd is implemented in those countries that country would be more um accessible and there would be less stigma against people with disabilities and more inclusion so i i think you know it's it's really important to them i think one of the things that's really i found interesting and i'm sorry i'm kind of long-winded today i'm excited about talking about all this is that um you know, the veteran community with disabilities, the, the wounded warriors or the disabled veterans, they really don't see themselves as a part of the disability co- community. And we really need to change that because we have to, a lot to learn from each other. And of course, a lot of the American disability laws are, you know, have their roots on what, you know, happened after World War II, um, you know, taking care of our veterans that were wounded and that kind of triggered a lot of programs and services that that led to great um, changes in U.S. legislation. um, Thank you for for, um, helping us. I don't think we're thinking that you're long-winded at all because there's a lot of valuable information and um, helping us understand more about the role the veterans play. Um, and disabled veterans is very helpful. I know we want to open up uh, to see if anyone in the audience has any questions. I know we've opened up the sidebar if anyone has, um, and I will just ask um, Dr. Na or someone to see if there's any way that if anybody in the audience would like to ask questions uh, is able to do that. And in the meantime, I did have just one follow-up question for you about the, the veterans, and I wondered if you felt um, how do you think that having such a strong amount of veterans organizations could have impact on U.S. ratification of, um, of CRPD, if you thought um, of an opportunity at all? Uh, you know, uh, a lot of the opposition to the CRPD came from um, the Republican side. And um, 
I think if the Republicans, you know, really understood how this will benefit the military families and veterans, then, you know, um, that might help, you know, in future efforts to ratify the CRPD. Uh, you know, there was there was several areas that I think probably Vlad or Andre talked about that the opposition had to the CRPD. So we've really got to make sure that we counter that and say none of that is true. And, you know, this is why the reservations, understandings and declarations are important. You know, if our law is better than what's even in the CRPD, we can use the RUDs um, in that regard. Thank you, um, Isabel. We do have a question um, from Steve. It says, as a member of the disability community, CP, I'm very frustrated and angry that the US has yet to ratify CRPD. Isabel, in your opinion, what is the hesitation to get the job done? So I think that goes to, again, the opposition. There were several areas that, that Repub Republicans were concerned about. Um, and it was that the CRPT would take away US sovereignty and sovereignty from the states, um, that, that it would take away parental rights. And also um, there was a lot of concerns about abortion. So that was one of the areas that Pat and I worked on was, you know, abortion kept coming up. And, and so I decided to look at all the countries at that time that had ratified that, that have laws that outlaw abortion. And, um, you know, there was a lot of countries that, that, you know, the abortion issue wasn't, you know, a big deal for them that, that they knew that, there's nowhere in the CRPD that, that discusses abortion um, or, you know, anything. It discusses the health and reproductive rights of women with disabilities. But abortion is never mentioned in the CRPD. What, what, are you, what are you hopeful about in terms of ratification in the United States? Uh, <laughs> woo, um, well, you know, the midterm elections, I'm hopeful that, that you know, we'll have a, uh, a Senate that's favorable towards um, UN treaties. You know, we, there's a whole list of treaties that haven't been ratified. Um, and, you know, the CRPD is probably one of the youngest ones compared to others. So, um, you know, I, I think when I think about the future, I'm like, okay, how do we jockey ourselves into the position to where we're the first, you know, our treaty comes up first. Um, and maybe it's because it's the simplest and easiest one to do. I don't know, but we're really going to have to work hard on, you know, getting bipartisan support oh. either way. So thanks. Yeah. Well. Thanks so much. Really appreciate your forthrightness uh, and your, um, and your eagerness to speak with us this afternoon. Um, Can I add in a little bit too from, from our classroom at St. Cloud State? I don't think anyone has a question, right? Okay, so just some feedback that, you know, when we asked that same question to Vladimir and to uh, Jose and Andre, and all of them kind of gave the same response about where is their hope in getting the ratification for the CRPD. And it is a long road ahead, but I am thankful that students are learning about the CRPD. And I think knowledge, equipping younger people with the knowledge and understanding and strategies for learning advocacy. So I encourage everyone to go to your website. I did find it under, I'm just going to reiterate that it is under the initiatives and you have different areas um, of learning how to be advocates more for championing the CRPD. I did have one last question for you as you talked about military bases overseas and how um, the cross benefit to US citizens within the countries where they are um, doing their service. One of the areas that we found out in our work with China is that uh, the challenges that exist within embassies for citizens of the country where they reside for the visa application and process. For example, we have deaf interns and scholars, one of whom is here today, 
who had their interview at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, and it was really a struggle to figure out how to get the sign language interpreters accessible and in the interview and vetted through the process so that uh, they could have a valid, reliable visa interview. So just wondering, you know, the cross benefit to not only US citizens placed in those countries, but to the citizens of those countries and having the leadership right, have, within the US embassies. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting that we actually have a lot of um, foreign embassies here in DC that aren't accessible. Yeah, I went to the embassy of Mozambique and had to climb down like a flight of stairs that were slate steps and really slippy and scary, quite mm. frankly. But um, I actually had something unusual happen. And that was that um, the when Secretary Blinken was the nominee, he, I got somehow nominated to um, be in this very small group discussion about State Department um, workforce inclusion. Mm. Um, and so I brought up a lot of different topics like that, that we need to make sure our embassies are not just physically accessible, that, but that they also accommodate the, the needs of individuals trying to get, you know, their visas. But, um, the other thing I, you know, I thought about was the housing for the employees, State Department employees mm -hmm. in the Department of Defense, all of our bases are required to have 7% of the military housing accessible for people with disabilities. So um, why can't they have that same standard applied as they build or renovate the housing um, for State Department employees? And, um, you know, in those countries where uh, there's armed conflict like Mozambique and, and uh, you know, many the other, so the other countries um, out there that are facing armed conflict, the embassies are shifting to, to where the employees are actually living on, on like a small base, you know, it's the embassy, but it's a, it's a really large place with, with lots of housing for their employees. So that's what they're doing in Mozambique. And I was able to see that firsthand and, I'm jealous because they have this beautiful view of the ocean, you know, mm. and they're literally, you know, steps away from the ocean there. And it's going to be a great assignment for someone uh, if they get there um, to be there, you know, and have accessible housing, hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. So we one can... last. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. We, we do have a one one question oh, uh, right. that I'd like to bring up. Um, and this is from Catherine. Um, Catherine asks uh, the SDGs. And uh, uh, if the aim that no one is left behind are giving new life to human rights, are the SDGs well socialized in the US? And do you think this is a mechanism that can be leveraged to advanced inclusion? Mm. Um, well, it, the CRPD hasn't been ratified. The US did make a commitment to the sustainable development goals. And there are several of those goals that kind of intersect with the CRPD. For example, women and girls, um, gender equality, you know, those intersect. And um, I, I really, I don't see at the grassroots level, you know, any awareness of the SDGs. Mm -hmm. um, I see it more at the national level. And I, I think, you know, whether you're a small community, whether you're a, a, a community in a rural area, um, you should be looking at the CRPD, uh, I'm sorry, the SDGs and the U.S. commitment and, you know, what the targets are and see what you can do, even at your very local level, to implement those goals. There's one final question, and we did touch on this just briefly, but I, and but I think each of our um, each of our presenters over the last weeks have answered some form of this. And this has to do with the, the kind of opposition uh, to ratification of the United States. And this is asked in this, uh, this form. And it says, it basically, are the Republicans aware that the U.S. is going to look foolish for not ratifying, this, ratifying the CRPD? And, and I'm, I'm just reading it directly, but I wondered if, if we're thinking about who, many people maybe are in opposition for many various reasons. 
But I wonder if you'll speak to this idea of um, how do you think that we do look for not ratifying this? What is your opinion on that? Because there can be a lot of different perspectives of how we look for not ratifying it and maybe any other perspective you'd like to give on that to close with that question. I think that the international community is really confused as to why we haven't ratified. Um, you know, but then we explain the politics and they get it. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, I mean, th there, there's no, I'll just share that, that, you know, during the CRPD and ratification effort in 2012, um, there was a lot of funding that was given. I heard $10 million at least was given to the Homeschool Legal Defense Fund. And we had nowhere near that money. Um, I think we had gotten a grant for 150000 over a couple of years to work on this. Um, and so they were able to, to get out there and do some strong media work using that money. And they were really able to get those parents that like to homeschool their children excited about, you know, the CRPD and how it's going to take away parental rights, like, um, you know, in other countries where, where homeschooling is outlawed, like in Germany. So, um, you know, that's, that's a big concern. If we're thinking about the future of, of ratifying, we're going to need some serious um, donor support. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if I've answered your question. I kind of had one of those middle age moments there and forgot it. <laughs> yeah. so, so, if that, so if that is then the, the what, how that money was used and that was ability to kind of do that messaging, what kind of, where is the messaging coming from that's going to support the United States CRPD? Um, that same messaging, is that coming from donors? Is there an organization that's working on that? I think we're a lot in a much better place than we were back in 2012. Um, for example, we have the the GLAD network, which is a network of donors, um, bi bilateral, multilateral donors. Um, you know, we have a stronger UN presence than we did back then, and um, I think in general more people are aware of it. And many thanks to what you're doing at the university to spread awareness. Yeah, so I'll let you say your closing comments, Michelle. I know we wrap up every class with some closing comments, but I just want to say on behalf of St. Cloud State University, it's about thank you so much. And I think, Michelle, in answering your question too, that social media campaign and whatnot can come from us too. So we just encourage everyone to start taking more action on your own social media and sharing about the CRPD and the sustainable development goals so that that messaging gets out. All right, I'll turn off my camera and let you take it from here, Michelle, for closing. Thank you, uh, Isabel. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you again, Isabel, for this afternoon. Reminding everybody that if you want to earn those CRC CEUs, uh, you can sign up on our website and we'll post the link in the chat for that. And we invite you to join us again for our next Ability webinar, and that's Wednesday, October 20th, when Gerard Quinn a U.S. Uh, Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disability joins us uh, to speak about the implementation of the U.N. Disability Inclusion Strategy. Good afternoon. Enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you again, Isabel, for a delightful conversation. Thank you for watching Embracing the Difference Globally, the Ability Event.